Good morning to all and all. Uh, the topic for today's clinical discussion is Thomas test. From briefly the history, Hugh Gowan Thomas uh, studied medicine at Edinburgh and the University College London and he attended MRCS in 1857. The Thomas test is named after Hugh Gowan Thomas. Uh, these are the few contributions of H.O. Thomas. In treatment of fractures and PB, he advocated enforced, uninterrupted and prolonged rest. For this, he developed the Thomas splint. The picture of the original Thomas splint shown on the right side. He also developed the Thomas collar for TB of the cervical spine. And he, uh, the Thomas test, which is uh, to be discussed today, for detecting the hip deformity was also his contribution. And the Thomas wrench for reducing fractures was also his contribution. Although uh, all these were invented by uh, H.O. Thomas, these are put into practice by his uh, celebrated nephew, Sir Robert Jones. On the picture on the right hand side, we can see the Thomas Rhymes being used by Sir Robert Jones himself. Introduction. The Thomas test, also known as the ILAC test or the Iliosolas test, is used to reveal the fixed flexion deformity of the hip and to measure the flexibility of the hip flexors. These are the, uh, these are the hip flexors. Uh, slice major and iliacus act as one joint muscles. Pectinus, adductor longus and brevis act as one, uh, are one joint muscles. While the tensor facial atta, sartoris and rectus femoris are two joint muscles. Coming to the anatomy of hip flexors, first coming to iliopsoas. It originates from the iliac fossa and the lumbar spine, as you can see in the picture, and it inserts on the lesser trochanter of the femur. Originates from the iliac fossa and the lumbar spine and inserts on the lesser trochanter of the femur. Nerve supply for iliacus is by the femoral nerve L2 to L4. While well, for the psoas major, it is by the anterior rami of spinal nerves L1 to L3. The action, iliopsoas is the strongest hip flexor, external rotator of the thigh at the hip, and lateral flexor of the tr trunk. Coming to pectinus, it originates from the superior pubic ramus, namely from the pectinal line of the pubis, and inserts on the pectinal line of femur and the lena aspera of the femur. Its action at the hip joint is thigh flexion, adduction, and external rotation. And it is innervated by the femoral nerve and the operator nerve. In the picture shown, uh, the muscle marked by green is the pectinus. This is the origin and this is the insertion. Coming to adductor longus, it originates from the body of the pubis, inferior to the pubic crest and lateral to the pubic symphysis and inserts on the middle third of the linea aspera of femur. Action at the hip joint is thigh flexion, adduction and external rotation and it is innervated by the operator nerve, L2 to L4. Uh, the muscle marked by yellow color is the adductor longus. This is the origin and this is the insertion on the lean aspera, middle third of the lean aspera of femur. Coming to adductor brevis, it originates from the inferior pubic ramus and the body of the pubis and inserts on the upper third of lean aspera of femur. Action, hip flexion and adduction. And it's innervated by the anterior division of operator nerve L2, L3. As we can see in the image, uh, the adductor brevis, the uh, muscle marked by green color is the adductor brevis, inserts on the inferior part of the uh, pubic ramus to the uh, upper one third of the lean aspera. Tensor facial lata originates from the outer lip of the anterior iliac crest and the anterior superior iliac spine and inserts on the iliotibial tract. Action at the hip joint is thigh internal rotation, weak abduction, and at the knee joint is leg external rotation, weak leg flexion or extension. And innervation is by the superior gluteal nerve, L4 press. This is the origin of the tensor facial actor uh, on the leg crest and the anterior superior leg spine, and it's insert here along the elliptical tract. Sartoris, the origin of sartoris is from the anterior superior leg spine and inserts on the proximal end of tibia below the medial condyle by the pest anserums. Innervation is by the femoral nerve, L2 to L3, and the action at the hip joint is thigh flexion, abduction, external rotation, and at the knee joint, it's leg flexion and internal rotation. This is the origin of uh, sartoris from the anterior superior iliac spine, and it inserts here along with the semitendinosus and the gracious tendon, from the pest anserums. Rectus femoris originates from the anterior inferior iliac spine and the supraastabular group and it inserts on the tibial tuberosity and the patella. Innervation is by the femoral nerve, and the action of the hip joint is thigh flexion, while the knee joint is leg extension. 
we can see uh, the reflected side of the rectus femoris and the straight of the rectus femoris can be seen here, originating from the anterior inferior leg spine and uh, inserts into the patella and the tibial tuberosity. What are the uses of thomas test? Thomas test is used to assess the flexion and extension of hip. It is also used to reveal the flexion deformity of the hip. Fixed flexion deformity of the hip. This occurs due to spasm of the hip flexor muscles or as a posture to avoid the pain. It can also occur due to fibrotic changes in the joint or fibrotic contraction in the periarticular soft tissues. When the patient has FFD, the extension is not possible and the patient cannot bring his feet to the ground. So when the patient is not able to bring the foot to the ground, what are the compensatory mechanisms that act? Uh, these are the following compensatory mechanisms. The, the pelvis tilts forward, which shifts the center of gravity anteriorly. As a result, the patient may fall forward. To restore the center of gravity, the patient arches the spine backwards by increasing the lumbar loudness. In order to reveal the FFD, we have to reverse the compensatory pelvic tilt and the exaggerated lumbar lordosis. So coming to the Thomas well leg flexion test. Procedure. Position of the patient, we have to make the patient lie supine on a firm couch and look for exaggerated lumbar lordosis. How to look for exaggerated lumbar lordosis? We have to squat to the level of the patient, see tangentially for lordosis. If there is exaggerated lordosis, Light from the opposite side is seen and we will be able to insinuate our hand under the lumbar spine till the knuckles cross the midline. That is if we are using our palm facing down. So you can see in this picture on the right hand side the arrow shows the exaggerated lumbar lordosis with light seen coming from the opposite side. So in figure A the pelvis is shown in a neutral position. So in a subject with uh, hip flexors of normal length the low back will tend to flatten in supine position. Well, in figure B, if uh, the low back remains in a lordotic position, uh, that means the hip flexor shortens and there is a flexion deformity at the hip. The palm up versus palm down technique. Uh, alternatively, we can place our palms facing up also. As the palm is flat and the finger points are more sensitive to touch. This is as described in Hamilton Bailey. The advantage of the palm uh, down procedure uh, is that the knuckles act as a guide for quantifying the exaggerated lumbar lordosis. The knuckles should at least cross the midline if the lordosis is exaggerated. So this is the uh, uh, palm facing up technique for checking the lordosis, and this checking the lordosis with the palm facing down. The most important component of the Thomas test is to keep the palm under the lumbar spine throughout the entire period of the test to appreciate the appearance and disappearance of lumbar lordosis. Coming to further parts of the test. We have to flex the hip and the knee of the unaffected side with the other hand. At the end of normal flexion, the upper end of femur hitches the anterior acetabulum. And further flexion using the femur as a lever will tilt the pelvis backwards. The tilting back of the pelvis will bring the lordosis to its normal position. This is appreciated by the patient's back touching the examiner's palm. And if the FFD is present, it gets revealed by now. Common mistakes that are done at this point are being too gentle on the flexion which may not obliterate the lumbar lordosis completely and too much vigorous flexion may move the pelvis that even the affected hip is taken into flexion. So figure on the left shows the correct test where the low back and the sacrum are flat on the table. The thigh, the, uh, thigh touches the table indicating the normal length of one of the one joint hip flexors. The angle of flex, uh, knee flexion indicates little or no tightness in the two joint hip flexors. And the photograph on the right shows the error in testing uh, the subject has excessive back flexibility. When he pulls the knee too far towards the chest, the thigh comes up from the table and the sacrum is no longer flat on the table. The result is that the ones are in flexors, which are normal in length, appear to be tight. Ask the patient to hold the flexed normal hip with his clasped uh, hands and passively extend the affected hip gently till the pelvis starts tilting forward. This is appreciated by the lumbar spine moving away from the palm kept under the patient's back. This step is done to neutralize any excess of flexion done forcibly resulting in pelvic tilt. So this is the position of the hip before measuring the angle of fixed flexion deformity at the hip. How to measure the FFT? We have to measure the angle between the couch and the affected thigh on the lateral side. 
So this is a picture from Das showing uh, the demonstration of Thomas test. The normal hip is flexed to the limit to obliterate the compensatory lordosis. This will flex the affected thigh to the extent of pixel flexion deformity. The angle F shown in this picture shows the angle of pixel flexion deformity. Assisting the flexion and extension. If there is no FFD, we can measure the flexion and extension at the hip. Patient is asked to flex both hips until the knee touches the chest. The hip to be tested for extension is released and allowed to extend to the table while the opposite hip remains tightly held against the patient's chest. To test for flexion, both knees are again positioned against the chest and the contralateral thigh is allowed to fall to the table while the thigh being examined is kept in maximal flexion. So in the uh, figures A, B, C and D, figure B we can see assessing the extension of the right hip. And figure C demonstrates the flexion contraction of the right hip. So you can see the flexion contraction of the right hip is seen. And in figure D, we can uh, see the assessing uh, flexion of the right hip. For bilateral hip involvement, we have to flex both hips in supine position till the obliteration of lumbar lordosis is present. Then extend one hip at a time and check the, check the FFT. The hip which is affected more is checked first, followed by the less severe side. Palaces. If there is fixed flexor deformity of the knee, also bring the patient to the edge of the bed in supine position and perform the Thomas test or make the patient lie prone and slowly extend the hip one at a time. Severity of flexion contraction will not be appreciated if the hip is allowed to abduct while performing the test. And if there is fixed lordosis, then FFT cannot be checked. Also, the test is difficult to perform in the presence of a knee which is ankylosed in extension in obese or heavy built individuals and bilateral involvement with painful restriction of hip flexion. Ashwin, I think you have covered all aspects of this topic. It's a good presentation. Krishna, sir? Oh, yes. Uh, what are the causes of uh, exaggerated lumbar lordosis? So there are physiological causes and pathological causes. Okay. Uh, the physiological causes uh, pregnancy. Uh, pathologically, the most common cause is uh, spondylolisthesis. Uh, Distitis, uh, rejection children. Okay, uh, the point is uh, you have to check whether the patient is having a lumbar lordosis exaggeration because of some other cause other than the fixed flexion deformity of the uh, hip joint. Uh, that has to be first ruled out. Uh, in a young patient, the spondylolisthesis uh, could be one reason. Uh, obesity and pregnancy are some physiological causes and in children there will be exaggerated lumbar lordosis uh, to uh, some extent. Okay, uh, you should have demonstrated the uh, method. Uh, you should have demonstrated instead of uh, telling all these things you should have taken a video or something uh, and demonstrated how to do. Show me the first slide because I joined a little late, 10 minutes late. Uh, you were talking about uh, Thomas test. All oh, right, okay. This was originally introduced basically during the tuberculosis era. That is something which uh, we should realize, and especially small children and adults. I mean, young adults, and subsequently, of course, not the old people. But because in those days, elderly people never probably survived beyond the age of 50, 55, because they would have died due to some other reasons. So usually some of these tests are done on children so that you could do it better. Not like adults when we get examined the patient in age. Regarding Thomas test, you you might probably get another question in the sense when the patient lies down, you go back to one of the examples, uh, one of the slides. One slide which shows the hip is inflection. Yeah, uh, another one without this, next one probably. Uh, no, go back to the previous one. All right, okay, keep it there. Keep it there. Because the patient might lie down with a little amount of flux to keep. Why is he kept keeping it flux? It is to accommodate the fluid which is occurring as a result of whatever infection, inflammation, whatever, to accommodate more fluid in the joint to ease the pain. It is more comfortable for the patient. So whatever the deformity with the patient lies, that is called the so-called apparent flux, because that's how the patient lies on the back. 
then we perform the Thomas test to reveal the actual amount of fixed fraction. So suppose the patient lies down, as in this case, about 15 degrees, and when you perform the Thomas test, it goes to 45 degrees of fraction. That means from 15 to 45, another 30 degrees of concealed fraction there, and which has ultimately resulted in a 45 degrees of fixed fraction. So the revealed fraction is ultimately the, uh, the 45 degrees of uh, uh, fraction. It, it, these are all hair splitting arguments, but when you are presenting a heat case, you can say that there is an apparent fixed apparent flexion deformity. Don't use the word fixed flexion. Apparent flexion deformity is of 10 degree, and then when I perform the Thomas test, it reveals another flexion deform considerable flexion of another 30 degrees, resulting in 45 degrees of fixed flexion. That's what I wanted to mention to face the examiner if he is a little pedantic and is going to ask such questions. But the whole purpose, of course, you have demonstrated very clearly that it is the loss of extension which is there. And you also brought out an important point like the pelvic tilt and the lumbar lordosis, which is a compensatory mechanism for the fixed flexion deformity. So, uh, I, I, and I don't think I need to add much about it because now the next question is whether you should keep your hand uh, down or up. Uh, whichever way is comfortable for you, uh, I would accept. Only thing is you should be able to detect the earliest movement of pelvic tilt or the oblique pressure of the lumbar lordosis. That is the uh, crux of this. Then you go back for the common sense mechanism. Next one. Uh, Yes, those are all uh, there. Uh, then some people might ask whether you should see light uh, through the uh, lordosis, etc. I don't believe in all those uh, funny uh, this thing. As far as I am concerned, these the candidate looking for a lumbar lordosis, exaggerated lumbar lordosis to reveal a flexion deformity or not. That is what I am interested in. And uh, you don't need to pull down the uh, couch and things like that, keep it on the floor. Uh, I have seen all sorts of uh, funny things being done in the uh, examination, which is not necessary. You keep it on a uh, uh, firm couch that is good enough, it should not yield. That's all. So you should be careful about it because subtle differences may be missed if you are keeping the patient on a formal bed. So you may not be able to demonstrate say 10 degrees or 5 degrees of fixed flexion deformity if this was present. Usually in an examination, we won't provide you like that of a difficult situation. We will definitely provide, in fact, uh, whenever we were conducting an examination, I used to keep a separate uh, uh, um, trolley outside, I mean nearby, so that if the patient wants to demonstrate, I mean, the candidate wants to demonstrate the findings, you can send the patient to that side. So it will be provided in the examination, no doubt about it. Anything is you should know about it. That's all. I don't think I need to add more about it. That's all. Uh, which side we have to stand? Uh, on the side of deceased hip or on the normal side? Yeah, yeah, on, on the right side. On. No, no. Uh, if you are uh, looking for a deceased left hip, it is always better to stand on the left side when you are performing the Thomas test. Uh, because uh, the patient will be holding the normal leg in the flex position and you will be able to measure and keep your hand under the uh, lumbar spine simultaneously. Okay, uh, so that will be difficult if you are standing on the uh, normal side. Have you understood? Yes, sir. Uh, so always stand on the uh, side of the deceased hip. In a postgraduate examination, you are uh, aim is to get into a quick diagnosis uh, in the in an elegant manner. So conventions are not that important. I used to keep the hand uh, in the uh, palm up position because I have got a smaller hand and I will be able to uh, feel the lumbar spine with the pulp of the uh, fingers. So uh, it will be difficult for me to insinuate my hand uh, till the knuckles are crossing the midline and still measuring and standing in a stoop position. Uh, so all these things are a bit uh, awkward for me. So 
so i will be keeping my hand in the palm up position and uh, patient will be holding the uh, normal leg and i will be measuring uh, the ankle you should know how to measure the uh, ankle with a goniometer that is why i am asking about uh, a video demonstration you are doing it for the first time in the uh, examination hall uh, how will you keep the goniometer will be a big problem for you it's actually a simple thing but in the examination hall you will be in a very awkward position and the examiner will make you fail if you don't know how to keep your goniometer properly i have seen a few candidates like that with the goniometer for the first time in their life so that is the basic problem in uh, any clinical examination if you yeah. are not uh, doing it continuously uh, day 1 uh, to until you are in the examination hall you have to examine daily then only it will become very fluent and uh, you can uh, easily go into the pathology uh, if you are not uh, fluent in your clinical examination technique you will be thinking about how to do then you won't be seeing the pathology if you are not thinking thinking how to do you will be easily seeing the pathology so the discussion will be quickly going into the pathology okay otherwise the discussion will be about how to do then it is a difficult situation if you are going to the pathology quickly then it will be a cake walk so can we discuss more about regarding bilateral uh, like this flexion deformity assessment ah bilateral uh, hip flexion deformity uh, is a difficult question in examination and different examinations will be expecting different answers uh, one standard method is chahelis method but it is difficult to be do, done on a uh, adult uh, if you are uh, looking a child with a bilateral hip disease you can definitely tell the chahelis method that is prone uh, position you can bring the patient to the edge of the couch uh and uh, you can look for the extension individually but that is a very awkward uh, uh, test as far as an adult is concerned and there are chances of uh, the patient falling from the couch so you can tell that uh, you do that only if the examiner asks you to do and always ask for assistance and uh, the other standard method is you flex the both hips simultaneously and look for Uh, flexion deformity. Uh, now, what was the regarding, regarding standing on either side? It doesn't matter, right? Which side you are, if it does, it is bilateral. Ah, bilateral. Uh, <laughs> uh, that is a good question. But uh, I think if you have got time, uh, if you are demonstrating in front of the examiner, you can just tell him. Uh, I would like to. What is the point uh, in demonstration? Uh, you have to show the examiner that i can do it so when you are uh, demonstrating it in uh, in front of the examiner uh, you can just tell that uh, if you are standing on the right side i am looking for the left side then you can ask the examiner whether i should i would like to stand on the left side you just talk uh, so you just convey the message uh, so the examiner will uh, give you the cue uh, so if you have got lot of time you can go to the other side and demonstrate it properly uh i would actually talk in the examination for more if you talk more the examination will be easier again the obesity or wasting effect the measurement of the posterior side of the thigh to the couch uh ah, if there is obesity naturally the uh, lumbar lordosis may be concealed sometimes accelerated lumbar lordosis may the patient may be having accelerated lumbar lordosis because of obesity and second problem is that may be concealed also because lot of fat may be uh, falling on either side of the lumbar spine uh, so these are the two problems in obesity now the question is not regarding this case like we had the uh, specific case the other day we had an axis deviation so will an axis deviation affect our measurement of the flexion angle uh, i will be reading about the axis deviation i am not uh, having ready made answer for the axis deviation i will just read about that and tell you later i never came across such questions in the examination hall the in the examination hall the things will be very simple they will be asking about how to do and if you demonstrate it properly uh, they will jump into another question they will not be uh, usually uh, splitting hairs uh, 